Welcome everyone to another installment of the 30 Days of Taker video series. That's right, 30 videos in 30 days celebrating the highlights in the career of Mark Calloway, who we all know more affectionately as The Undertaker. Today, it's a retro review. We're going back and reviewing Fully Loaded 1999. Wow. Interesting to take these journeys back in time over two decades ago and just the single biggest thing, there were two really, two really striking things going back and watching this show. Number one, the star power. Like even the mid-card acts were incredibly over. The crowd was really hot, like just phenomenal. Everybody seemed to have something to do. Everybody had a shtick or a gimmick. Like, when we talk about these glory years of WWF, glory years of professional wrestling, you go back to shows like these, these are just, you know, shows that bide you time until you get to SummerSlam the next month. And these shows were kick-ass. And the presentation, my God, when you look at how gritty and tough the presentation was, by comparison, how in your face it was, the crash TV elements and how they work, the overbooking and even how that worked. It's just truly remarkable going back and watching an old show like this and then coming back to reality of what we get now with professional wrestling. Thank you to the Twitter user that suggested I review Fully Loaded 1999. Let's see what they did. I know why you suggested it now, you jerk. But I'm not going to do it. Nope. I'm not going to give you the satisfaction. I'm depriving you of it. It's bad enough. Every time I take this trip back in time to the Attitude Era, that I might encounter this. But the show's got to kick off with it. If I didn't have to go down memory lane with this Memphis mid-card piece of crap, 10,000 guitars broken, and zero on it, exercise again, zero times drawn. And what's worst of all is how they served up a young, impressive talent like Edge, who was actually starting to get over here, to fucking lay down for the thunder, slappy McSlap that's himself. And what's worst of all about this is the fact that Edge won the Intercontinental Championship the night before the house show. Only so that way, freaking Russo can sit there and book the Memphis Bay Card piece of crap to get another Intercontinental Championship ring. And all the puppies in the world from Denver are going to say this. All the gang real interference just made me want to absolutely vomit. So once again, we had to sit there and deal with the new Intercontinental Champion, Jump Fucking Jarrett! And the only thing that saved this, and the only thing that saved this, was Stone Cold Steve Austin coming up and stunning his ass into oblivion! Fuck Jeff Jarrett! I hesitate to give in to you guys whenever you suggest one of these Attitude Era shows, because I know where you're going with it. I see right through you! Moving on, though. You had a total of five championship matches on this show. The second one was a three-on-two Acolytes Rule WWF Tag Team Championship match. Man, was this a trip down memory lane, huh? The Acolytes taking on the Hardy Boys and their manager. That's right, Michael P.S.A. It wasn't Doc Hendricks anymore. I wonder how many people they even remember this era of the Hardy Boys when Michael P.S.A. was their manager. Hey, look. This match was cool. Like, it wasn't great. It wasn't special or anything. But the Hardys got in their stuff. The Acolytes got in their stuff. You told a little bit of a story. And Michael P.S. Hayes ultimately did his job, which was go in there and eat the pinfall. And the Acolytes win. No complaints with it at all. This is one of the lower quality matches on the show. And it was still decent. Yes, it was mostly an undercard title. And yeah, da 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 And they... Had a lot of belts back then. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I kind of miss the European Championship. 
Because, man, there used to be some really good European champions and some really good storylines here. Now, I don't know if D'Lo Brown and Midian necessarily constitutes a good storyline, but going back and watching this show 21 years later, there's a couple of things that I came away with. Number one, D'Lo Brown's Tope Suicida was badass looking. Like a lot of people today's wrestling don't want to overuse that move, so go back and watch him and see how the hell it looks and how the hell it should be done. Number two, his low down that five-star frog splash, if you want to call it, his frog splash, whatever the hell you want to call it, looks sick. And again, a lot of people wrestling today should take a look when they want to use this damn move to see how it should be done. And number three, most importantly of all, D'Lo Brown wins, and it just made me realize you know, how cool D'Lo Brown really was back in the day. I used to call him Mr. Shotgun Saturday Night. You're looking at the real deal now. Got a little soft spot in my heart for D'Lo Brown. I don't know about you guys, but damn. It was good to go back and watch him in his peak. Hardcore championship between... <laughs> match between Big Boss Man and freaking Al Snow was just high comedy to me. Like, good God, Al Snow. This was when he was at the peak of... What does everybody want? Head! What does everybody need? Head! And the talking to himself, and he's the job squad, pin me, pay me, and boss man kind of being that more militant police type figure. Like, these two had pretty good chemistry in these hardcore matches. This wasn't the only one they had. I remember, wasn't it the next month at SummerSlam that they did a similar type of deal? Um, you know, this one was cool. Like, I appreciate how both guys kind of were their own unique characters. They did some fun stuff. I always wonder what would have happened if Big Boss Man actually would have been able to do this shit with the golf cart, but the golf cart wouldn't start. Um, but cool enough, it was something different. Big Boss Man won. Hooray! Next up came a standard match. It was Big Show versus Kane. The special guest referee of all damn people was freaking Big Shot Bob Holly. Good Lord. What in the blue devil's going on here? Anyway, this is a trip down Nostalgia Boulevard. You know, the, the spot at the very beginning of the match when Big Show picks up Kane over his head, Gorilla presses him and throws him out. Like, Kane barely got a piece of the rope, which was designed to slow him down a little bit. Man, that bump looked sick. Like, that looked like it really hurt. If you're going to do stuff like that, make it look real, because God damn, that looked real. And you also go back and you watch a match like this, and... You forget just how athletic these guys were earlier in their career. Like for big men, in the case of uh, the big show, Giants, you know, just how well they could move. You know, it's an okay match, but, you know, those are the kind of things that stood out to me. You know, the X-Pox getting involved, like, holy hell. Um, or excuse me, in this case, it was Undertaker, you know, really getting involved, which led you to think that, you know, maybe Austin was going to come out because I really like the way they did this and the whole build up to the main event. Like, you knew what the main event was. It's The Undertaker versus Stone Cold Steve Austin. First blood, end of an era match. Austin loses. He could never wrestle for the WWF title again. If Taker loses, Vince was never going to be on WWF television again. But the way they did it at the beginning of the night, like I think it was even on Sunday Night Heat when they had Taker attack Austin and bust him open. You know, you're doing a first blood match, so that makes a lot of sense. And then Austin kind of going on this mission throughout the night and eventually getting to Taker backstage and beating the brakes off of him. But waiting, you know, not coming out when Taker's out there interfering post-match, but coming out and doing something, you know, behind the curtain, like, a really, really good buildup. The type of presentation I'm talking about that we just don't get in today's uh, WWE, and I really, really miss it. Iron Circle Match. Yeah, that's right. It was called an Iron Circle Match. You basically went outside and you had a bunch of cars lined up in a circle and a bunch of random wrestlers standing outside there. Like, I think it was Sergeant Slaughter and a bunch of other people. Midian was out there, like, just crazy. It's Steve Blackman and Ken Shamrock, and... You know, a couple of things really stood out to me with watching this. Number one, it was really re weird to go back and watch this and see Draz was still standing up and walking around. Call me more of it, but that feels kind of weird. Yeah, that's how long back we go with this. Uh, number two, man, they, I've always felt like they missed the boat with Ken Shamrock a little bit. You could have somehow, some way, figured out at some point in time an excuse to put the WWF title on him. 
And even as an Intercontinental Champion, I think he gets slept on a lot. Like, the thing about Ken Shamrock, maybe he wasn't everybody's flavor, but he was a legit badass that nobody would ever question. And he was good enough with his character where everybody believed that he was truly freaking crazy. Like, he was the craziest man in wrestling to a degree, and you felt it, you thought it. And you didn't know what the hell he was going to do. So a match like this, a fight like this with Steve Blackman was perfect. I didn't even like the way they did this. Like, having him to the point where Steve Blackman's knocked out and Ken Shamrock wins, but then he's kind of walking around like anybody else going to want some of this and nobody does. Like, man, going back and watching this is just a reminder of, like, how cool Ken Shamrock used to be. And they did some good things with him in WWF, but I can't help but feel like they could have done a little bit more. Am I right? Mr. Ass and China versus Road Dog and X-Pac. Winning team gets to use the name to Degeneration X. Now, there is a stipulation. Like, almost every match here had a stipulation on this card of some kind, which, again, kind of speaks to the peak of the Attitude Era, both good and bad. Uh, but here's one, and this one means something. You know, I still, to this day, like, going back and watching it, I could have done without seeing Mr. Ass in that ring gear. God. And the whole time I'm watching this, I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, wasn't it the next month they had him and The Rock wrestle at SummerSlam? <laughs> no wonder Rock didn't want to freaking work with them. <laughs> but going back and watching China, man. Ah, damn. Like a lot of people say a lot of things, especially people in wrestling over the years about China, but you know, China was a star, man. She was a big star. As you know, you got all these women doing like the intergender wrestling now, and I, I largely am not not down with it. And then you'll get the well, well, China did it. China was fucking China. China was legit. China was believable. China was a big time freaking star. And anybody that ever wants to diminish her can kiss my pasty ass. You want to do some of that stuff on the independent scene? Cool. That's your business. Now, if you want to do it in a situation where you got somebody that's even somewhat similar like China, again, we can talk. Let's do business. But, man, going back and watching her, crazy. And it's just crazy to think about how over these folks were, like Mr. Ass in China, over big, freaking X-Pac and Road Dog over big. Like, the crowd was really invested in this match. And when X-Pac and Road Dog won and they get to retain the rights to the name, like, the place went bananas. And this was just a match over the rights to a name in the future. Like, that's crazy. That's this type of match here. If you were showing somebody what wrestling used to be like and why it used to be so cool, this is the type of match that you show them. Loaded number one contender strap match. Triple H versus The Rock. Yet another of the classic matches that these two guys had over the years. Like, going back and watching this match, man, you, you remember just how great these two guys were in the ring together, how great their chemistry was, how great their timing was. And then, of course, you got China out there and eventually bring out Billy Gunn as well. Like, it's just just crazy to go back and watch this. And, uh, you know, this did about the best they could with the strap match. Even the overbook, the outside interference and the overbooking elements were really well done. And... You know, it was, these two guys had some really good matches on the come up to where they were establishing themselves in those true top spot roles. And this, again, you know, similar to SummerSlam 98 and so forth, is just another one of them in their lengthy catalog. Uh, great stuff here. Triple H won. And, of course, he became the number one contender where he would later go on to not win at SummerSlam with all the shenanigans that happened there. If I remember correctly, it wasn't China a number one contender at one point in time, but then it was Mankind. Uh, <laughs> so that way Austin didn't want a job to Triple H. <laughs> Hunter learned some real godlike politics from Austin. Austin said, I'm not dropping it to him at SummerSlam. I'll drop it to Mankind, and you could drop it to Triple H afterwards. And that's exactly what they did the next night on Raw in Minnesota. <laughs> they sat there and had Mankind drop it to Triple H. It's crazy. But going back and watching this match, man, this is really, really good. If you haven't seen this match in a long time or you've never seen it, go watch this fully loaded strap match between uh, Triple H and The Rock. And it was really good. Without them having to bleed out and bust out all over the place, which I think is a real skill. 
And especially noteworthy because the main event that was coming up afterwards was a first blood match. So you don't want to sit there and do a bunch of blood crap. Finally get to the main event. The first blood end of an era WWF championship match. The Undertaker versus Stone Cold Steve Austin. And you're going to get a special treat. Because coming out to do commentary is Mr. I Broke My Coxus, Vince McMahon. Mr. McMahon on commentary. And it wasn't just Vince McMahon on commentary. It was really Mr. McMahon on commentary. And when you think about a few years before, you would have had Vince McMahon, Jerry Lawler, and Jim Ross on commentary. And it was okay, but they were really being hindered by Vince. They were really being held back by Vince's presence in large part. Um, but man, when you go back and watch this now in 1999, JR is at his absolute peak. Just phenomenal. Stone Cold! Stone Cold! Stone Cold! And Jerry the King Lawler, just the perfect Heenan style apologizer for all the heels and so incredibly quick witted. Just fantastic. Even though chemistry between the two is so clear and so obvious, like at one point in time, well, I can't remember if it was during this match. It was an earlier match in the night. JR said something to the effect of, I wouldn't think you want to talk about litigation with the year you've had, King. <laughs> like the way these two guys played off of each other, they were both in their peaks and their prime just fantastic. And now you throw Vince in there and he's being a cheerleader for The Undertaker. Just awesome. Like... The match itself, you know, wasn't going to go an incredible length of time. And as I've said before, some of the matches between Austin and Taker, I haven't always been the biggest fans of, but this was one of them that was that I thought was pretty good, actually. I actually really did. Um, it's crazy when you go back and think about how over everybody used to be and how hot wrestling used to be and how hot the WWF was in 1999. You know, not only was Shane running and getting a big reaction, but X-Pac coming in and trying to make a save got a huge pop. And I mean a huge pop. Holy hell. Eventually, as you go through all of this, you know, eventually it's Stone Cold that ends up busting The Undertaker open. And even the way they did this played out so well. Like, it was clear to the camera and everybody else that Taker was already busted open. But Havner was off in the corner recovering from the spot from a couple minutes ago. And then as Taker gets Austin up and turns around, then Earl Hebner kind of comes to and sees it and says, ring the bell, it's over, he's bleeding. Like, just genius. And even when you want to talk about, you know, for some of you that might not like the overbooking or the dusty style finish of having everybody damn run in, but you got freaking Billy Gunn running in, or who the hell was it that ran in here? I can't even remember. Yeah, yeah, x Pac, yeah, Billy Gunn, you had freaking The Rock comes in and Triple H comes in and like, all of it worked. It just worked. And maybe it's part of it is nostalgia going back and watching this over two days, two decades later, that this show feels so damn good. But this admittedly to me was just a really good show to go back and watch. And I would highly recommend you go back and watch it again if you haven't watched it in a long time. Or if you've never watched it, you need to go check this show out. It's not going to be the five-star masterpiece full of tremendous matches but if you care about characters and personalities and stories and moments and kind of aha, oh shit things, like this is the type of show. This is peak Monday Night Wars wrestling. This is peak Attitude Era WWF at its finest. Except skip past the opening match unless you want to sit there and pretend like Edge is wrestling thin air. Uh, yeah, you can, you can certainly skip dirt. Um, a really, really good show. Glad I got a chance to go back and watch it and ultimately review it. So again... That brings an end to this 12th installment of the 30 Days of Taker video series. Ooh, about 40% of the way completed with this thing. We're going to do it, baby! Thanks again for watching. Smash that subscribe button. Check out the other videos in this playlist. I hope you won't be disappointed with it. I'll see you later.